introduce it here today and then pass you over to David Bundy, who is going to be looking after today's lecture and introducing our speaker and chairing the meeting so far. We are new at this, so we're going to find out how this all works. We're not sure about that yet, but we shall see what happens. We'll do the best we can, and I hope we have a wonderful time together as we, um, as we think and work together. If you put everybody else on, if you put yourself on mute then uh, for the, uh, the duration of the thing, except for uh, Peter Ray, who will look after us, and David Bundy, and our speaker, of course. We will organize ourselves that way, and after uh, uh, Sergey has finished his lecture, Peter Ray is going to give us the instructions for our question and answer period and how, how that will work out. So let's have a quick moment of prayer and then begin our virtual residential period. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to gather like this even when we can't gather face to face. And I pray that our time together over the next weeks, days and, and weeks will be a very blessed time, an enriching time, a strengthening time, an encouraging time for those who are in the midst of their research. And I pray that this will be the time when we learn from each other and gain from the opportunity to listen to papers and to reflect deeply on their significance. Thank you for this group of people around the table today, this virtual table, and go with us today in all that we do and say, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So David Bundy, if you would like to uh, take the microphone and take over from here, thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you, Kent. Uh, welcome all of you to the One Day Theology Conference. We uh, are excited today that uh, our lecturer is Sergei Nikolaev. Uh, he is the E. Stanley Jones Professor of Evangelism and President at the Moscow Theological Seminary of the United Methodist Church, where he has been ministering for 15 years uh, in those positions. He also serves on the board of the publishing ministry of the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry for the United Methodist Church. Uh, uh, he is uh, on the planning committee with Jordan Hammond for the next uh, Methodist Historical Conference. He's been active uh, in the Methodist related theological schools uh, organization for Europe. In, uh, he's a, a very accomplished scholar. He has, uh, he finished his dissertation in 2007 at Southern Methodist University. Uh, he is, uh, his dissertation was on the church and reunion in the theologies of Sergei Bulgak Bulgakov and uh, George Florovsky, uh, looking at the period uh, 1918 to 1940. He has uh, published uh, an important article in the uh, uh, Oxford uh, Methodist Handbook. Uh, on the Orthodox challenge to Methodism in Russia. And uh, it's a very important and very fine essay in that book. He has participated at the American Academy of Religion, uh, where he gave a lecture in the Wesleyan and Methodist Studies Unit on uh, Julius Hecker, a Methodist missionary educator and martyr in Soviet Russia. And he's working on a related essay for the Manchester Wesley Research Center project on heirs of pietism from the 19th to the 21st century. Sergey, it is a uh, pleasure to welcome you today to uh, NTC, even though neither you nor I are there. But uh, it's uh, good to have you with us today. And we're looking forward to your lecture on Methodists in Northwestern Russia and Moscow. Uh, 1889 to uh, 1937, a study in Methodist identity. Thank you. We're eager to hear you. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I wished I, I, I was there uh, with all of you, but um, it happens that we are here with all, all of us together. 
I appreciate uh, especially Jordan Hammond's invitation to, to uh, be part of your one day theological conference uh, um, from Moscow uh, at the United Methodist Seminary. We uh, uh, a look at how uh, your school is developing and uh, we are uh, learning and uh, hope we continue to learn uh, from uh, the great su success that you are having. Uh, this essay is an initial inquiry for a bigger project of studying development of a minority Protestant identity within an orthodox and emerging atheist context in the first part of the 20th century. It examines the life of the Methodist Church in Russia, primarily through the work of three prominent Methodists in the period beginning with the organization of the First Methodist Church in 1889 and ending with the dissolution of the Methodist community in northwestern Russia in 1939 during the Great Purge. It is also a contribution on the one hand toward a critical history of Russian Methodism and on the other hand, an attempt to understand the value this history provides for the present and future people who claim to be truly Russian and truly Methodist. Methodism entered in Russia in a historically significant way in 1889 as a mission of the Methodist Episcopal Church. There are references to early Methodist work with Russians tracing back to 1860, but with no Methodist community emerging as a result. For example, Frederick William Flocken, a Russian-born member of the New York Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church and missionary to Bulgaria, reported baptizing four Russian children in Tulce, Bulgaria, and now it's Romania, as a side note. Bent August Carlson, an American born in Sweden and the presiding elder of the Finland district of the Sweden Annual Conference. After multiple requests from Russia and several preliminary trips on a visit to St. Petersburg with Bishop Charles Fowler, organized a small Methodist congregation with seven probationary members to serve the Swedish population. Over the next 16 years, the number of Methodists in Russia did not increase much because Russia still had a legal prohibition against conversion to non-Russian Orthodox Christianity in the late, late imperial period, although less stringently enforced than earlier due to the rapid social and economic change Russia was undergoing. Nonetheless, conversion among non-Russian Orthodox confessions typically required permission from the state the Russian Empire had great interest in regulating confessional affiliation because in addition to ideological reasons, it relied on confessional records for determining the age, of the, the, the age and legitimacy of children, inheritance rights, eligibility of ex exemption from military draft, and for entering state service, as well as conferring rights on the place of residence and access to education and certain occupations. Because of its entry into Russia as a confession serving a foreign minority, Methodist services could not be advertised in newspapers. Methodist evangelism had to be aimed at the Swedish and Finnish populations in the St. Petersburg area during private visits to people's homes. In 1904, there were only 20 officially recognized Methodists in Russia. After 1905, the situation changed considerably in two important ways. In 1905, the Russian Empire passed a series of legislative measures, including the Edict of Toleration, liberalizing its religious order and granting its subjects freedom of conscience. The religious legislations of 1905, though granting greater religious freedom to the subjects of the Russian Empire, were rather confusing for practical use. 
the Edict of Toleration of April 1905 legalized conversion from one Christian faith to another under certain conditions and recognized some non-Russian Orthodox faiths. The October 1905 degree that granted freedom of conscience was a broader and less clearly defined legislation, which, however, superseded the earlier edict. These measures allowed Methodist meetings in Russia to be implicitly recognized by the state from 1905 on. Thus, in 1907, the Russian-born and Finnish trained pastor Yalmar Salmi, who could preach in Russian, Finnish, and Swedish and communicate in English, was able to obtain state permission to hold religious meetings in St. Petersburg province. Within a year, he reported over 150 Methodist converts in the Hunterva circuit of six preaching stations. In 1907, Bishop William Byrd appointed Dr. George Albert Simons to be the new superintendent of the Finland and St. Petersburg Mission Conference and the presiding elder, Nadziratil, of the Russian district. Simons, an American son of a Methodist pastor, was trained at Baldwin Wallace College, Berea, Ohio, New York University, and Drew Theological Seminary. He oversaw the work of the Methodist community in northwestern Russia at its pre-revolutionary peak. Simons, though reluctantly, had to leave Russia in 1918 because the government of the United States recalled him after the American invasion in Siberia and Arkhangelsk. However, even from Riga, Lithuania, his new residence, he continued to oversee the work in Russia until the 1924 General Conference approved establishing the Baltic and Slavic Mission Conference separate from the Russian Mission Conference. In 1909, the Methodist Church was explicitly recognized by the Russian government. And on a typical Sunday, the first Methodist Episcopal Church in St. Petersburg would have a German-speaking service at 10 a.m., English service at 11.30, Russian at 3.45 p.m., Swedish at 5 p.m., and Finnish and Estonian at 6 p.m. In 1911, Bishop Byrd organized a separate Russian mission conference with 13 preachers, 15 congregations, eight seminary students, three deaconesses, 500 members, nine Sunday schools, 700 children, four buildings, and a publishing house. In 1908, Sister Anna Eklund, born in Finland and trained at the Bethany Deaconess Training Centers in Hamburg and Frankfurt, was appointed by Bishop Burt to start Deaconess work in St. Petersburg. She opened the Bethany Vifania Deaconess Society the first Sunday of November with four Russian women. And in the 1909-1910 appointment year, reported 87 days of taking care of the sick, 218 visits to sick, poor, and needy, as well as providing free and paid massages to 160, 163 patients. They are organized a Christmas party for 125 children and elderly people, whom they fed and provided with gifts and clothes. In one of the villages, for example, 28 family homes, mainly Methodist, burned down in a fire. Three days later, Sister Anna and two helpers went there with support of every kind to help them. The Northwestern Russian Methodist community directly endured the October Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 and its devastating consequences. Quote, property and work intact, all well, end quote, stated the cablegram that Simons sent to the... Folks, we seem to have a, a little bit of a freeze up here at the moment. We'll uh, send a note and ask Dr. Nikolaev to, uh, to, to rejoin and start again in a moment. Well, folks, I've sent uh, uh, a, a note to uh, Dr. Nikolaev. Uh, and I'm he's... back. Oh, excellent. Delighted to Thank have you, you back. Come on. I'm, come I back don't in. know what happened, but I'm 
Glad to be back. Welcome back. Good. <laughs> uh, carry you. on, please. <laughs> um, okay. Property and work intact. All well stated the cablegram. Okay. And, uh, and then at first, the method's reaction was still positively colored by the February 1917 revolution, which had removed the Romanov monarchy and installed the provisional government. Simons viewed the new state order as a God-established order. Among other things, he was thrilled that, quote, the time of persecution, imprisonment, and exile for the word of God is past in Russia, end quote. May 1st, Simons held an open-air Methodist meeting in a park near the First Methodist Episcopal Church with over 1,000 people present and over 1,500 Methodist brochures distributed in addition to New Testaments. The Methodists continued this outreach every Sunday at 5 p.m. with an orchestra for four months. To Simons, this openness seemed a fulfillment of Bishop Bird's encouragement that there would emerge a new Russia, probably sooner rather than later and that the Methodist Church would be there to preach the word of God to this great nation. It was in a similar spirit that Dr. Julius Friedrich Hecker, future Methodist martyr in Russia, returned to his homeland after the Bolshevik Revolution. Born in St. Petersburg of German descent, Hecker immigrated to the United States, where he converted to Methodism in New York and received a call to ministry. He graduated from German Wallace College in Berea, Ohio, Drew Theological Seminary and Columbia University, where he studied the sociology of religion. Initially joining the East German Conference, he transferred to the New York East Conference and was appointed an assistant pastor at the East Side Parish and the Church of All Nations for work with Russian immigrants. Before returning to Russia, Hecker worked for John R. Mott at prison of war camps in Austria with the Russian prisoners on behalf of the YMCA. Importantly, in 1916, he developed extension education by correspondence that allowed him to be in contact with the prisoners of war for years, even after he left Austria. He was approved to help with Methodist work in Russia. Hacker Acceptable Cable Ground Simons to the Mission Society Headquarters, November 2, 1917. Hacker required special confirmation from Simons because he was somewhat an inconvenient person for the Methodist mission. On the one hand, he was very intelligent and energetic. On the other, Julius Hacker was a Christian communist or Christian socialist. Though he did not agree with the methods used by Russian revolutionaries, Hecker believed that the Russian Bolshevik revolution created a state of order preferable to the Tsarist regime. In the past, Hecker's sympathies with the Russian Bolshevik revolution had caused him problems with the US Department of State. Still, Bishop Nielsen was confident, quote, Dr. Hecker is an idealist of the finest type he does not care for personal gain or comforts, but gives his time and strength unstintedly and without any personal considerations to the cause to which he has committed himself, end quote. The cause to which Julius Hecker committed himself in Russia consisted of his humanitarian efforts, educational initiative, and engagement with the Russian Orthodox Church. When Hecker, after an absence of many years, returned to Russia in 1921, he returned as a supervisor for distribution of humanitarian aid and medical supplies that had been collected in the United States. This aid had been gathered for Russia, which had been decimated by one of the greatest famines in Europe, which had claimed the lives of an estimated 6 million people. In the course of his visit, Hecker traveled to Samara, Arenburg, and Buzuluk, areas that he stated were some of the worst affected by the famine, and concluded in his general report, 
that the best course of action to help the suffering people of Russia would be to increase the contributions of relief organizations, give financial credit to the Soviet government for purchasing much needed grain supply, help the Soviet government to reestablish the railroad system, and not to be afraid to deal with the Soviet government in general. Another of Hacker's ideas was to appeal to Frank Mason North, the corresponding secretary of the Board of Foreign Missions of the Methodist Episcopal Church, to raise funds in the United States for those children suffering from the famine, both directly as support for individuals and collectively for opening orphanages. This idea had the support and approval of the Commissioner of Education of Russia, Anatoly Lunacharsky. In a similar vein, after Hecker had moved to Russia together with his family, he sought to identify and offer to the average Russian person a healthy and affordable source of nutrition. After conducting some research, he selected oats, the only hindrance that prevented implementation of his idea was the lack of an, of an initial investment. Hacker came into sufficient funds after publishing his book, Religion Under the Soviets in the United States in 1927. Consequently, he acquired a factory for processing oats and even came up with a brand name for the product, Hercules with the underlining idea being that by eating oatmeal, one could become as strong as Hercules. He even wrote a rhyme for advertisement. Health is given to everyone, but in somewhat limited measure. So eat oatmeal from the factory Hercules. It rhymes better in the original Russian. Здоровье каждому дано. Да как-то все в обрез. Так пейте шталокно завода Геркулес. Unfortunately, the Soviet new economic policy NEP that allowed enterprises like this to emerge came to an end with the ascension of Stalin to power in the late 1920s, and Hecker lost his factory in 1921. Nonetheless, the common name of Hercules for oatmeal in Russia survived the Soviet period, existing to this day, and became one of the iconic descriptors of every man's life in the Soviet Union. Uh, as a side note, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, we didn't call oatmeal oatmeal, we called oatmeal Hercules, so it was so deep in popular culture. Hacker's unique educational and cultural background placed him in a position to pursue ambitious projects in this particular historic pe historical period. The educational initiative was the most ambitious of them. It was based on Hacker's model of extension education by correspondence that he developed working with the Russian prisoners in Austrian prisoner of war camps, which in turn was based on the Methodist correspondence course of education for their pastors in the United States. There was an entire generation of young Russians that grew up in the years of the Russian revolutions and the subsequent Russian civil war. It was entering into adult life with little or no education. The Russian government was concerned about providing them with education, but it did not have experience, equipment, or funds to build a new educational system. The American system of education by correspondence was of particular interest to the Russian educators. And Julius Hecker was the person engaged for the task to bring it to Russia. Luna Charsky and Vladimir Lenin's wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, supported Hecker's work to the point that in 1922, he was given free use for 10 years of a seven-story building in the center of Moscow, Arbat district. 
to develop nationwide correspondence education, particularly for, quote, teachers, foremen, and other qualified workers, end quote. The aim was to develop practical education, end quote, so that the masses may learn to work and the productivity of the trades and professions be improved, end quote. Moreover, Hacker was asked to do this with the help of foreign capital and put it on a self-supporting basis, if possible. Within a year, there were 15,000 students enrolled in that teacher's correspondence school. Furthermore, Hacker was asked to lecture on educational sociology and American education at the Moscow Graduate School of Pedagogy. Bishop John Nielsen, the overseeing bishop in Europe at that time, affirmed that this work, this was work of tremendous significance. Hecker's primary engagement with the Russian Orthodox Church also was in the area of education. Through the financial aid raised by Bishops Blake and Nielsen and Dr. Lewis Hartman, the editor of one of the early American Methodist newspapers, Zion's Herald, the Russian Orthodox Church was able to reopen the Moscow Theological Academy, which had been closed in 1918 after the Bolshevik Revolution. Once again, as in the case with the Russian State Commissariat of Education, Hecker was invited to take part in teaching at the graduate level. Here, he taught in the chair of Christian Ethics and Sociology, educating the future key leadership in the Russian Orthodox Church. Likewise, Hecker was invited to help with its extension correspondence course. The majority of clergy had to be trained through home study courses particularly in preaching and Bible study. In 1924, the list of students taking the correspondence course contained about 2,000 names. Hecker also took part in helping the Methodist Episcopal Church to develop a relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church. In conceiving of Christianity fundamentally as the individual and social experience of Christ, along the lines of the social gospel movement prominent in the United States in that period, and in contrast to understanding Christianity as an ecclesial tradition, Hecker found himself positioned more closely to the circles of the Russian Orthodox Church that were pursuing reforms in the church than to the traditional patriarchal Russian Orthodox Church. However, the Methodist Episcopal Church Board of Foreign Missions was careful not to side with any division of the Russian Orthodox Church in the 1920s. In addition, progress along these lines of cooperation was hindered by the fact that the United States did not establish diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, which was formally founded as a state in 1922, until the end of 1933 during presidency of Fra Franklin D. Roosevelt. Through all of these projects, Hecker was led by the basic conviction that communist ideals better corresponded co with the ideas of Christ than capitalist ideals did. And he wanted to make Christian communism work both in the life of regular Russians, as well as on the state level in Russia. This is why he went to Russia in the 1920s. He dedicated himself to education Russians for better life through the correspondence courses, as well as educating the future Russian Orthodox priests for better parish ministry. He was associated with the renovation groups within the Russian Orthodox Church because he believed that this would make it serve regular Russian people better. Hecker believed that the Soviet communists were anti-clerical, but quote, religious as yet have not developed a definite religious philosophy, end quote. In my talks with the communists, writes Hecker to North, I frequently turned to the conversation on the subject of religion and found them inevitably deeply interested. He was positive, 
much good could be accomplished by anyone who would develop and direct the potential religious forces of the communist movement. Hacker's legacy is complicated because in addition to the religious, political, and educational ideals shaping his life's journey, Hacker was in the position of bridging the American and Russian cultures and churches. As a connecting link between the Russian church and American Protestantism, Dr. Hacker renders a service of very great importance, pointed out Bishop Nielsen in his report to the Executive Committee of the Board of Foreign Missions. As part of his position, Hacker would defend Russian communism in the United States and Europe and hoped for an opening to influence people religiously in his circle of influence in Russia. The other side of that position resulted in the fact that neither of the sides accepted Hacker as their own and eventually promoted accusations of him of spying for the opposite side. The United States accused him of being a red spy, whereas Soviet Russia accused him of being an American spy. With the ascension of Stalin to power in the late 1920s, Lunacharsky was dismissed as commissar for education, and Hecker, like many other Russian leaders associated with the church, was arrested by the NKVD. He spent several months in prison and was released only after the appeal of the Commissar of Foreign Affairs, Georgi Chicherin. In 1934 and 1935, Hecker was allowed to travel to the United States and Europe on lecture tours. In the fall of 1935, the Board of Foreign Missions of the Methodist Episcopal Church entertained the idea of joining up Hecker's lecture tour with the well-known Methodist evangelist E. Stanley Jones, though these did not come to fruition. This was the last time Hecker corresponded with the Board of Foreign Missions. February 16th, 1938. During the Great Purge, Hecker was arrested and executed two months later under the accusation of being an American spy. His good name was rehabilitated by the Soviet Union April 15, 1957, a few years after the death of Stalin. American sociologist Earl Edward Eubanks, on meeting with Julius Hecker in 1934, described him as a person making a strange impression of one both younger and older than his real age. His face kept the youthfulness developed from his idealism and hopes for the future, at the same time having wrinkles caused not only by bitter disappointments, but also by deep suffering. His speech was surprising mix of a deep thinker and impractical dreamer. Interestingly, modern historians often describe Methodism in similar contrasting terms pragmatic and naive, deep thinker and dreamer, idealistic and practical, all at the same time, Hecker was formed by the Christian way of life in the Methodist Episcopal Church. It was a distinctive way of being Christian, but this way gave Hecker conviction and strength to return to Russia with five little children, to put his energy, talents, and time to better the life of ordinary people in Russia, not to give up even in the face of a dehumanizing social experiment of Russian Bolshevik communism, but to attempt by the preaching of the gospel to elevate, ennoble, and Christianize communism, even at the cost of his own life. In conclusion, George Simons was recalled by the US government from Russia in 1918. Sister Anna Eklund was asked to oversee the life of the Methodist community 
after him. She had to leave the country in 1931. The 1929-1930 appointment list tells the story of the expansion of this Methodist community from St. Petersburg all the way to Moscow, Ukraine, Belarus, even to Siberia. Dietskoye Silo, Gatchina, Kharkov, Kyiv, Leningrad, Luga, Moscow, Minsk, Novgorod, Oskol, Petrozavodsk, Pskov, Sigolova, Sinyavina, Smolensk, Strugi, Krasnaya, Staraya Rusa, Raskazova, Handrovo, Tosno, Tiflis, Troitskaya, Chudova, Tver, Volosova, Vishni Volochok, Mariinsk, and Novosibirsk. These are the appointments for that year. Despite the dedicated service of George Simons, Anna Eklund, martyrdom of Julius Hecker, and sacrifices of several thousand first-generation Methodist Russians who had embraced Methodism as a new lifestyle, they had to face the militant atheism promoted by the Soviet state. When in 1939, Bishop Wade of Northern Europe finally got a visa to enter Soviet Union after trying for over 10 years. He held the annual conference of the Russian mission, which appeared at the, that time to be the last. It lasted all night, recalled Wade in his letter. I baptized four children and married two couples. No one dared act as a secretary. At the end, Wade advised the few remaining Russian Methodists of the Methodist Episcopal Church to join the Baptists or some other evangelical group, thus dissolving the Methodist community in northwestern Russia in 1939. Through the service of Simons, Eklund, Hecker, and other Methodists in Russia between 1889 and 1939, we see fully dedicated Methodist Christians concerned about the faith and lives of ordinary Russians. These Methodists spent their lives in Russia, providing humanitarian relief, guiding people to Christ, and seeking to bring the hope and love that Methodist Church preached to the Russian people. However, although we are left with their inspiring examples and their ideals, their efforts failed to produce a self-sufficient church that could survive through the Soviet period in Russia. One might argue that it is unfair to fault early Russian Methodists for failing to lay the foundation necessary for the church to survive through the extraordinary and difficult, one might even say exceptional, persecution of the Soviet period. However, Given that the future is uncertain, today's Methodists face the necessity to establish a Russian Methodist identity as an integral part of the Russia United Methodist Church. The church needs to be self-sufficient and train the next generation, including for seminary education. Methodists need to focus energy on making lasting contributions in training and education while encouraging the dedication and talents of individual personalities. The failure to establish a self-sustaining Russian Methodist identity hindered the survival of Methodism in Soviet Russia. One lesson from the past for the present and future of Russian Methodists is that the establishment of Russian Methodist identity is key to making lasting contribution to Methodism in Russia, come what may. Thank you. This is the end of my paper. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nikolaev. We're, I, I think you've covered ground that will be new territory for many of us, and so interesting to, to hear this. I'm going to uh, collate questions, and I suggest we do that in the following way. Uh, if you have a question, there's a, there's a feature that allows you to raise a hand in Zoom, and so you can raise your hand, or if you like, you can send a chat question, noting that you have a, a question, and I will, uh, I will call on you to, to ask a question. 
and then you can unmute yourself and the question will come. We have, we have a few minutes for questions and so uh, I will give an opportunity to, uh, to see what you might have to ask about uh, the, question, the topic that Dr. Nikolaev has raised. Uh, David, I see you there. Do you have a question to start us off? I do. Uh, thank you, uh, Sergey, very much for your uh, well, fascinating and uh, helpful paper. Uh, one of the questions that came to mind uh, more or less immediately uh, at the beginning of your paper was the issue of the influence of the Pashkovite uh, uh, developments uh, coming from uh, St. Petersburg and across the country. And that uh, caused me to think of the issue of class uh, issues with regard to the, the beginnings of Methodism. So those are, in a sense, two questions, influence of Pashkovites and the issues of class. Uh, this is actually uh, uh, my initial entering in, in all the pro problematics of uh, um, uh, this history. Uh, at this point, uh, from uh, the sources I find, uh, Methodist sources, uh, uh, there is not much uh, reference to the Pashkavite movement, even though, of course, it was uh, much uh, more numerous and much a uh, longer movement in Russia by then, and of course, it's dangerous to talk about after 1905. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but they, they found their ways around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, especially in Ukraine, uh, as, uh, yeah, yeah. as far as I know, um, and and of course, uh, of course, uh, the Pashkovite movement uh, uh, was. Uh, Prominent in Moscow, also there's a uh, the house, the palace, really uh, by the Red Square, which is part of the Kremlin uh, complex now, which is Pash uh, Pashkov Dom House, Pashkov House, and in fact, um, uh, when we celebrated fifth uh, hundred anniversary of the Reformation three years ago. The official uh, Russian government's event uh, gathering with the Protestant churches happens in, in that uh, how, uh, Pashkov house. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, Methodist connections uh, with the Pashkovite movement, uh, my initial reading is that um, uh, it was. Uh, more connected with the American diplomatic circles, kind of, at least uh, in terms of uh, the leadership. The leadership uh, really was uh, American and European at that time. And uh, um, I think, well, the connections, the correspondence and the ministry uh, was connected with United States and Europe. And uh, yeah, uh, this is a question I will keep in mind uh, as my uh, research continues. Um, and of course, there, there's uh, some good critical studies of Pashkovite movements and, and Baptist history in Russia. So uh, I will be uh, kind of in dialogue with, with those studies uh, in any case. In terms of the class, um, again, the leadership of the Methodist Church uh, was highly educated. Yeah. And uh, most of them received education either in the US or in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of regular churchgoers, um, I would not claim with certainty. My sense is uh, it would be from classes aspiring to have connections with uh, foreign educated people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
and uh, in uh, around uh, St. Petersburg, there's more rural kind of uh, connection because I mean, uh, not too many educated people lived in rural areas in the imperial Russia. Uh, but in terms of the centers, like St. Petersburg, Moscow, and larger cities, uh, my sense is that uh, it's high, highly educated people who found Methodism attractive. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, I will keep that uh, as my in mind for my research. You know the Pashkov archives are at the University of Birmingham, huh? I did not that did not know that explicitly. I uh, knew that um, there they were was a, yeah yeah ah uh, in just uh, to to comment a little bit further. Um, uh, yeah. In terms of one of the challenges of early Methodist history in Russia is uh, because they, they were kind of, they were two centers. One was Methodist Episcopal Church in the no, uh, Northwestern Russia. One was Methodist Episcopal Church South in Vladivostok in the Far East of Russia. Uh, that's one uh, kind of thing that makes it very interesting. Um, in terms of class between Northern and Western Russia and uh, far east of Russia, whereas Northern Western Russia, they were, uh, I mean, these were people, uh, if not kind of supportive strongly, but friendly to the new uh, communist uh, order. And I mean, uh, District Superintendent and George Simons, I mean George Simons and Julius Hecker, both of them, they were actually active supporters of uh, the Bolshevik order. Uh, in the far east of Russia, Methodist converts uh, were from the upper crust of the late imperial Russia. Uh, those were immigrants and white guard army officers who were running away from the Red Army that was uh, moving from uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg to, uh, to Central Russia and to the far east of Russia. And uh, this will be also a fascinating kind of uh, for, for, for me to, to uh, discover connections. And, and uh, that's one uh, thing that's in terms of class, the class. Uh, in terms of Pashkov connections, and the complexities is that uh, at least in the far east of Russia, I haven't uh, thought in those terms in terms of north northwestern Russia, but in the far east of Russia, Methodism there was very open ecumenically. So it's um, kind of uh, they invited and worshipped together with the Baptist, uh, of course. Uh, Pentecostal movements uh, was emerging at that time. And um, in, in fact, uh, and because uh, Methodism was dissolved in 1930s, Baptists and Pentecostals claimed the uh, uh, her Methodist heritage as their own to the point that uh, uh, one of the leading preacher, graduate of the Methodist Seminary from the Far East of Russia in the Russian bibliography uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, encyclopedias uh, is, uh, the entry is that one of the founders of Pentecostal Church in Russia. <laughs> in, in terms of the Baptist connection, there's um, uh, kind of, during the Soviet time, uh, of course, the Soviet government forcefully put everybody under the Baptist umbrella. So all Protestant evangelicals, everybody in, in, to the Soviet mind was Baptist. 
and uh, so th that's another level of untangling uh, 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 one needs to deal with, uh, kind of trying to reconstruct uh, a particular uh, stream of Protestant methods, in, in, in my case, uh, history uh, under that umbrella. Thank you. Let, let me see if we have anyone else who has a question they'd, they'd like to put. Um, if you'd like to either uh, use the raise your hand feature or maybe indicate in chat that you have a question. Uh, I, I won't force you. We've, we've, uh, Dr. Bundy has, uh, has had a, a couple of good questions there, but if there are any others in these last couple of moments. Uh, Jordan, did I see you with a question? Um, yes, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Sergey. Could you talk to us a little bit more about the relationship with Hecker uh, and maybe some of the other leaders with church planting and congregations on the ground? What kind of uh, relationship was there and what kind of, sort of effort did they put into local church or congregational life during their missionary work and uh, time in Russia? Thank you, Jordan. Uh, this is a very good question and Hecker is not a good representative uh, to, to uh, kind of use for, to answer that question. Uh, he um, uh, came to Russia kind of with high political and government connections, whereas the rest of Methodism in Russia was kind of not close to that. So he, he was dealing with the bishops, both uh, Methodist Episcopal Church bishops, and Russian Orthodox Church bishops uh, with the Minister of Education in Russia. He uh, was teaching at the academy, so graduate school, and uh, he, his ministry uh, primarily was in education and ecumenical relations and um, kind of political connections. Um, he as far as I know, he did not start any church. And um, in fact, this is uh, one of the areas I, I am looking to contribute to in hacker studies. Uh, recently, several books, and in fact, there, there was a movie put together uh, on the hacker family. Uh, his uh, daughter survived during the Soviet time and, and kind of had some uh, prominent cultural connections in the Russian society. Uh, but uh, publications and books on, on him have no references whatsoever that he was a Methodist missionary. <laughs> His family also kind of uh, vaguely aware of it only. Um, it, it's, uh, there's some uh, paradox. Of, uh, I, I'm uh, very perplexed about that. Uh, like uh, Eight years ago, uh, Bishop Miner, who is passed now, and myself went to visit them. Uh, the... the uh, remaining family and uh, Hecker's younger daughter was still alive at, at the time. Um, and uh, for hours we were listening to, to uh, kind of fa fascinating life and stories of, of Hecker. Uh, but they uh, were very surprised that there's a church, Methodist church, which is in Russia, <laughs> which uh, kind of uh, uh, wants to claim uh, the legacy of their father and grandfather uh, and great-grandfather as one of the leaders uh, uh, of Methodist church. 
at that time. So uh, this is, I, I think that this is a puzzle and I, I am looking forward to untangle it. In terms of um, regular uh, kind of, uh, I mean, uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church proper, Hecker really is, he is a unique case. Uh, the bishop, uh, I mean, uh, the district superintendent and the deaconess uh, house, uh, they were the primary kind of areas to, to uh, do mission work, uh, evangelism, and uh, especially through uh, social services. For example, um, in 19, let's see, even before the Great Famine, um, uh, there was a kind of epidemics of cholera in St. Petersburg. And uh, there were references in the state, uh, in the government newspapers that Methodist deaconesses kind of uh, provide services in the places where uh, others are not very eager to go to. So um, this were, were the primary uh, channels for evangelism and um, sharing the information about the ministry of the Methodist Church that is preserved in the material that I, I read at this point. Uh, I still need to find more about uh, a regular ministry of pastors and lay leaders. Um, I know more at this point about uh, the Far East of uh, Russia uh, ministry. And there, uh, the leaders of the church, the Russian converts to Methodism, they were most of them professional career officers from the White Guard. And they were very disciplined in organizing a mission and, and, uh, and uh, serve, uh, developing churches and evangelizing uh, one of the uh, kind of unique uh, areas of ministry in the far east of Russia was uh, music ministry because of uh, uh, kind of a lot of Russians there were upper crust. There were a lot of uh, well-educated people with music conservatory degrees. So they, they actually um, put together uh, one of the first Protestant hymnals in Russia uh, uh, in that area, uh, which is called uh, the Songs of Harbin, which Baptists claim now it's, it's their hymnal. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of the building uh, local churches, evangelism, uh, I need to, to uh, learn more in terms of Northwestern uh, Russia mission. Thanks. Thank you. Any, any further questions? I'm, I'm scanning the, the field here. Um, uh, Dr. Brower, I think you have a question. Oh, you need to unmute yourself there. Unmute. Yes, I was just going to ask the question. Uh, how was the rehabilitation of Hecker in 1957 explained by the Soviet state at the time? And, and what actually was said about his religious background as, as distinct from perhaps his contribution to education in uh, the Soviet Union? Uh, well, uh... Thank you uh, for this question. It's uh, he was not uh, accused of being uh, his accusation did not have religious background. He was accused of being an, an American spy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in terms of 
rehabilitation documents. In fact, I can read. Uh, I have a. Um, um, the doc, uh, the actual official entry of, of uh, there's a Komunarka shooting range just outside of Moscow where he was buried. And the document says that it's very dry kind of document. Uh, Julius Hecker, uh, born in 1881, St. Petersburg, German, uh, higher education degree, uh, the, uh, he worked at the Institute of Philosophy, doctor of uh, PhD, lived in Moscow, arrested February 15, 1938, um, uh, shot in Moscow, 19, April 19, 1938, um, just on the decision of the NKVD, which is a, a early name for KGB. Uh, and uh, it was signed by Stalin, supposedly Molotov, Kaganovich, Danov. Um, and then just rehabilitated April 18th, 1957. So the official document there kind of doesn't have much details. Uh, I will need to go into the KGB archives to, to uh, Kind of learn more. Uh, there, I don't know whether the KGB archives are open at the time. In the nineteen in the nineteen nineties, uh, for a period of time, they became open. Then they were closed again. So I hope they'll be open when, when I get ready to get, go there. Thanks very much. Well, I, I've uh, I have spread the word around, and uh, I, I know Dr. Bundy has one last question for us. So I think I, I will give him the, the the honor of asking that one, and then we will wrap up. So, David, thank you. Uh, the wonderful thing about your paper, Sergey, is that questions just keep popping into my mind, which is a very happy thing for me. The uh, question I have is uh, related to the impact of Thomas Ball Barrett in. Uh, uh, Tallinn and in St. Petersburg and Finland uh, in 1913 uh, and both before, before and after that, but especially 1913, there were a lot of articles published in the St. Petersburg uh, newspapers attacking him and attacking Pentecostalism. And I'm curious if that has, if the uh, Methodist connections to Pentecostalism have any uh, impact on the uh, state uh, uh, view of Methodism or popular views of Methodism for that matter. Um, I haven't uh, found um, uh, kind of direct connections. I'm sure there are direct connections between the Methodist Episcopal Church community and the emerging Pentecostal movement and, and churches in Russia at the time. Um, I, I have found direct connections, including particular person who, uh, after leaving from the Vladivostok from Harbi in Manchuria, he actually came to uh, the northeast of Russia and uh, became active in the Pentecost, emerging Pentecostal church. Um, in terms of um, government's view of um, Methodism, uh, th there's a couple of periods really. Uh, uh, before the revolution, uh, Methodists, Methodist community in Northwestern Russia positioned itself as a uh, American connected uh, Protestant church. Uh, it's, it's very clear in the uh, title of, of their uh, periodical. Uh, and uh, it's a Russian version of Christian advocate. Yeah. It's a translation, but some articles are translation, some are 
just uh, local articles. But the, in the name, it was uh, uh, kind of, it, uh, the connection was very clear. Uh, with uh, the beginning of, uh, kind of uh, World War One, uh, uh, and then later with kind of uh, American uh, expeditionary uh, forces uh, yeah. going into the far east of Russia in Arkhang Arkhang Arkhangelsk. Um, uh, Meta is decided that they, they'd rather be connected with a uh, European Protestant kind of <laughs> a, a bigger picture for the Russian government uh, uh, and uh, disassociated themselves a, a, at least uh, publicly with American connection. But uh, that's the bigger attempts that's visible in, in the publications. Um, I haven't found yet uh, uh, the, the Pentecostal connections, and I'll be very interested in looking for them. Well, thanks, folks. Uh, several of you have helpfully uh, pointed out that I missed a question from David Field. So although we were going to have a last question there, David, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you ask that last question just before we wrap up. So go ahead, please. Unmute yourself and, uh, and ask the question. Great. Thanks, uh, guys. It's been a stimulating paper. Um, just, you mentioned the difference between the Methodist Episcopal Church South in the eastern part of Russia and the Methodist Episcopal Church with Hacke in the, uh, the, the St. Petersburg, Moscow area. Um, I'm wondering what influence the theological differences played in terms of Hacke, um, as I understand him, very limited knowledge was very influenced by a social gospel by Harry Ward, um, a very different understand theological understanding, and therefore perhaps easier to have this um, link in with the communist government. I mean, Harry Ward and other the strong socialist tendencies, uh, but a lot had lost a lot of the personal dimensions of Christianity and salvation. Um, as opposed to the Episcopal Church, which is much more uh, Episcopal Church South, which is much more conservative, and maybe that also plays on the questions around church planting, evangelism, not really been such a big issue for Hacker theologically, um, as might have been the case in other contexts. Uh, thank you, David. This is a very uh, perceptive and uh, helpful question. Uh, uh, in there is, uh, uh, from what I'm reading, uh, there's a trajectory that kind of supports your question, really. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, Methodist Episcopal Church South's missionaries were more conservative than uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. It's, uh, of course, uh, a gen generalization it's uh, unfair uh, f for me to say that but but th 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 there is a certain uh i think trajectory that, that could be discerned uh, and uh the missionary the the, the foremost missionary in methodist episcopal church south was a uh, really a practicing pastor. So he, he uh, um, came there and uh, really the primary work was to, to um, help start starting churches, uh, local churches. And, and of course the uh, seminary emerged because the churches needed uh, uh, trained pastors. Uh, everything was happening very fast at that time. Uh, I mean, it's a, another very fascinating piece of history. Uh, Harbin, China was the largest Russian diaspora outside of Russia at that time. And this was the center of um, Methodist Episcopal Church South's mission. And uh, um, now that I'm having said uh, out loud uh, a few sentences. 
I think I, I would not be, I should not be too fast, I think, uh, saying that uh, uh, identifying Methodist Episcopal Church South with more conservative theology and Methodist Episcopal Church's mission with uh, more liberal. Uh, uh, Hacker himself clearly was more liberal and, and, and uh, social gospel kind of. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, he, even before living right, he left Russia running away from the uh, police because he was a revolutionary, really. They wanted to capture him. So he was already a revolutionary before he became a metrist. So kind of it, his life trajectory kind of aligned him with, with that uh, kind of theology. Uh, but uh, in terms of Methodist Episcopal Church's uh, theology as a whole in Northwestern Russia, I, I need to do more reading actually. And, and uh, it's a very good line of uh, uh, looking into that, David, thank you. Well, thank you, folks. I'm uh, I appreciate your uh, your your engagement with questions, and and uh, Dr. Nikolaev, thank you so much for your lecture, uh, for starting off our research period uh, so well. Um, I I will perhaps just uh, note uh, before we close uh, two things. First is that through this next week, uh, Monday to Friday, we have a series of uh, research student-led papers starting off on. Monday with uh, Fernando Cavallo and Daniel Arnold uh, between three and five, uh, and then through the week. We also have two more uh, public lectures. Uh, I would remind you of the Manchester Wesley Research Center lecture uh, with the Professor Karen Westerfield Tucker, another look at the Methodist Wesleyan Love Feast. Uh, that is on uh, the Tuesday the 16th at 5 p.m., so a little later. And then uh, a, a different direction uh, with the Professor David Clough, the Sydney Martin lecture on the 24th of June at 7.30, Consuming Creatures, the Christian Ethics of Eating Animals. So you'll want to, uh, to uh, sign up for those. You can find details on the college website. And indeed, if you are interested in participating in some, uh, in, in, in some of the student papers, then you can uh, send a note to uh, Dr. Brower or myself, or, use the uh, college Facebook site to contact us. You're, you're welcome to join in. I'm sure students would be delighted to have a large audience hearing their papers and commenting back. But thank you all for participating. A particular thanks, Dr. Nikolaev, for connecting up, for not being put off by the vagaries of Zoom. We're sorry <laughs> not to have you here to celebrate with you in person, but uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll give you a round of applause electronically and quietly as we, as we uh, say thank you very much. For your thank lecture. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we thank you for your hospitality. A pleasure. So thank you. You can see those, uh, those, those thanks as they echo around the screen. Thank you all for joining in. We're, uh, we're grateful to you. And uh, we do look forward to that, uh, those next lectures. So thank you, folks. Bye now.